Ark says that Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to everyone, because I'm afraid that so many people have not prepared them. Tonight, we have the most controversial topic, I think, in all of Christendom. <laughs> uh, the topic is the rapture and the day of the Lord. If, you're, if this is your first night, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. So the topic specifically tonight is the rapture and the day of the Lord. So would you just pray with me? Father, we do pray as we come to this important topic of your coming. Lord, I pray for myself that I may be clear, that uh, I may have your spirit resting upon me, and that you will enable your people to hear and to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think that people get more heated on this topic than any other topic uh, that I've taught. Um, why is that? We all believe that Jesus is coming again, I'm sure. So why do people get so heated about the timing? Because that's really what we're talking about, the timing of the Lord Jesus. And uh, there are things that he has written and told us about ahead of time so that we can be aware of them. Uh, he does tell us in one place, no man knows the day nor the hour. And that is true. We're not going to know the day. We're not going to know the time. But we should, according to Scripture, understand signs of the times. And we've already gone a, a little bit into that over the past weeks. So as we come to this topic, can we purpose in our hearts something? Can we lay aside all preconceived ideas? Because we come to this topic with all kinds of lenses over our eyes of what this Bible teacher says, what that Bible teacher says, and I don't know about you, I've, I've been in, in, in church now for 37 years, I've been following Jesus since 1977, and I've been in churches that hold to each of the different uh, uh, stances uh, concerning the timing of the rapture, so uh, I would love for us just to come to the scriptures, does that sound good? What does the Bible say about the timing? I promise that I won't manipulate. I promise that I will bring Greek words and help you to understand what the Scriptures actually say. And I, I'll try not to stand on any other teacher's toes, but I'm sure I'm going to somewhere along the line. So forgive me right up front <laughs> for what I'm about to do. <laughs> now there's four different topics to viewpoints as to the timing. And as I've previously stated concerning the timing of the events that lead up to the day of the Lord, last week we talked about the day of the Lord, and we said that it was going to be the rapture followed by the day of the Lord. Those things both come together. Some believe that the events that are, were, that are, are written in the book of Revelation were fulfilled in 70 A.D., those individuals that believe that are called preterists. I am not a preterist. I believe that the book of Revelation and the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21, they're all speaking of future events, events that we see happening in our lifetime today. So my stance is I am a futurist future, I believe in what God is doing, that that's, these things are still yet future. Now, among the futurists, there are four different beliefs as to the timing. Firstly, there is the pre-tribulation rapture. There is the, secondly, there is the mid-tribulation rapture. Thirdly, there is the post-tribulation rapture. And fourthly, there is the pre-wrath rapture. Now, I'll explain these concepts in a little bit, and, and we'll have a diagram up on the screen. One thing that I've done for you tonight, there is so much content, 
And in actual fact, this class I've cut down into two classes. So uh, I've already got the room for another night making this eight weeks, eight consecutive weeks. If you can't stay with me for the eighth week, then I understand. But this topic of the rapture, I think, is one of the most important things that uh, we need to understand. So I've took the rapture and I've parted it. And I've, last week we talked about what is the rapture? And we said that the rapture is God snatching his people away. And uh, we also said that that's the resurrection, the resurrection uh, in the last days. And I don't need to labor and t go over those things again. But uh, <clears throat> the post-tribulational believers believe that it's come, the rapture will come right at the end of the seven years. We've said that there's a seven-year period spoken of by the prophet Daniel in chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, and we also said that right in the middle of that week of years, Daniel's 70th week, Many people call that the tribulation. I do not agree with that term being used as the seven-year period because uh, the scriptures do not teach that the tribulation lasts seven years. And I will uh, we'll go into that and look at it and go in depth at it. Pre-wrath believers believe that the rapture will take place at some point in the second half of the seven-year period, during the tribulation, uh, it doesn't, they do not believe, and I'm including myself in that. I have, uh, as I have studied the scriptures now for 37 years in depth, uh, I have come to the conclusion, along with many other Bible teachers, that uh, the church does go through at least part of the tribulation. No man knows the day nor the hour because Jesus said that time will be cut short. He uses those words, cut short. And we will look at that. Uh, so, what is the tribulation? We, we talk about this seven-year period, and as I said, people call it the tribulation. What is the tribulation? Because some believe that the tribulation, the seven-year period, is all the wrath of God. So what is the tribulation? The Greek word that's used is thlipsis. T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. Thlipsis. My Hebrew Greek word study Bible, excellent Bible, AMG Publishers, they, I've gone into that, and they, they give me the actual word, and uh, I can go to the back of the book, and, and it tells me exactly what it means. So here's what it means, and I've got most of tonight I've got up on the PowerPoint because I'm, I'm going to be going quickly over, because there's so much content, so I, I've had mercy on you and, and put it all into PowerPoint. Now, two large chunks of Scripture is not in PowerPoint because I want you to go with me in the Scriptures. So, the word flipsis means this, to crush, press, squeeze. It means tribulation, trouble, or affliction. Flipsis conveys the picture of something being crushed, pressed, or squeezed as from a great weight. It is used to denote grievous physical affliction or mental and spiritual distress. Not once is this word ever referred to as wrath from God. Here, the word is thlipsis. This Greek word in the New Testament occurs 22 times. Of those 22 times, the word is descriptive of trouble and difficulties that the believer will go through in your life. And I'm sure many of you, including myself, have gone through trouble and difficulties where it seemed like I was pressed, I was squeezed. That is the word tribulation. Trouble, it can be affliction, and it could be just a, a number of different things. But it is never the wrath of God. For instance, when Jesus was teaching the parable of the sower, he said that we should expect tribulation or affliction. 
as Thlipsis is here translated. And I've got it up on the PowerPoint. The one on whom, whom was sown, on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction, there's our word thlipsis, when affliction or thlipsis or persecution, notice that persecution is put together with thlipsis. And I think that when we read the passage in Matthew, it should be translated as persecuted. But there, I'm not the translator. I am uh, affliction, thlipsis, or persecution arises because of the word immediately he falls away. And I've got another passage, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4. Of those 22 times, most of them the scriptures, and you can go in and, and go to Bible Gateway or Bible Hub and you can examine this for yourself. Here's another one. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf, Paul says. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all of our thlipsis. Affliction that's translated there in the NIV. So it is, it is correct that God never pours out his wrath on his believing people, yourselves. However, we have all gone through tribulation and our brothers and sisters all over the world at different places are going through great, great tribulation, great trouble at the moment uh, with ISIS, especially in Syria and Iraq. Many Christians are going through great persecution. People that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture need to rely heavily on interpretation and will always offer scriptures that talk about the wrath of God being the seven-year period. But I say again, the scriptures do not ever call that seven-year period the wrath of God. So, God wants us to understand that we will not have to go through his wrath, but that there will be a time of difficulty or thlipsis, persecution or tribulation. What does he tell us about tribulation? Historically speaking, the pre-tribulation rapture is pretty new to the church. You might not know that. We do not see evidence of people teaching this particular doctrine the way it is, it is being taught now prior to 1830. And it started with a man by the name of uh, John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren who began to teach what he called the secret rapture in 1830. Now, many great men of God have believed that the church will go through the tribulation. Can I give you a few names? You might be shocked. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, Matthew Henry, John Knox, John Huss, William Carey. These are famous men. If you're new to the faith, these are famous godly men. William Carey, John Calvin, Isaac Newton, George Whitfield, A.B. Simpson, George Mueller, John Newton, Jonathan Edwards, John Wycliffe, John Bunyan, and many others. We could go on for some, some way. But in 1830, John Nelson Darby began to teach what he called the secret rapture. And he would later produce his own translation of the Bible. You can check on this in Wikipedia, that name. You just put in that name and you'll get all the history of the pre-tribulation rapture. He produced his own translation of the Bible from which he removed entire verses, corrupted biblical doctrines, and tampered with key passages concerning the second coming of Christ. John Darby has been called the father of dispensationalism. He promoted his theory of the secret pre-tribulation throughout the 19th century, and later his theory gained wide acceptance with the Oxford University Press published the Schofield Reference Bible. Anyone got, had a copy of that? 
I had a copy of that. I still got a copy of that. It is gathering dust, you know. <laughs> but I've had it right from the beginning of my Christian walk. I saw that and all of those notes, and oh, I was entranced, you know. So I had to buy that, and I've still got it. Kind of falling apart, but anyway. So anyway, once, uh, once his notes were all in the Schofield Reference Bible, then this rapture theory managed to make its way into some of the bigger Bible colleges in the United States. Schofield's notes clearly point to a pre-tribulation rapture. Well, this theory was further reinforced by popular films in the 1970s, such as Don Thompson's Thief in the Night. Anyone seen that? Few of you? Thief in the Night? None of you ever seen that? Come on! That movie? The Thief in the Night? Well, I'd never seen it either, but I thought it was very popular. <laughs> but I'm sure that many of you, or some of you, have read the books such as the Left Behind series. They are dramatic presentations that have actually become part of the American evangelical belief and culture. And people now start with that viewpoint already in their, in their minds. And it seems to have gotten out through different Bible colleges. But, but when you ask those individuals, well, where is it in Scripture? They cannot point to Scriptures. Now, there are one or two assumptions which we will go into tonight. And we will not wheedle, wheedle, and that's an English word, and it wheedle around things. But we, we'll look at it head on and, and examine. Because I, I really want you to know this. I think this topic is one of the most important topics because we need to get prepared. And if we think that we're flying away uh, before we're getting any trouble, then I, I just don't want us to be unprepared for that time. Now, talking about those films and the books, I personally, I thank God for the books, although it has changed people's thinking, but it, it has opened a lot of people up uh, and opened them up to, this, to the Lord. And they've gone seeking the Lord because they don't want to be left behind. Once you see that movie or read those books, uh, a lot of people have come to the Lord because of them. So I thank God for that. But we need to go to the scriptures as to what does the Lord say? Let's go to the Bible. Because if it's not found in the Bible, I really don't want to know it. And I, as I say, I've studied this book now for 37 years, and I have not found explicit scriptures. Even John Walvoord, the guy that wrote The Rapture, uh, he's probably one of the preeminent uh, people that hold to a pre treatment Even he said that there is no explicit scripture. Anyway, tribulation is something that the saints have always gone through. Jesus said, when you are persecuted, rejoice, for your reward will be great, Matthew 5.12. Now, of those 22 times that the Greek word thlipsis is used, there are only five verses in the whole of the New Testament where, where thlipsis is specifically used in the context of the end times, the seven-year period, the coming of the Lord, etc. Each time it is used, it is only spoken of as happening after the abomination of desolation, which we've already talked about. Turn with me to Matthew 24. We will look at these five times that this uh, word is used and examine it in depth. We remember that the seven-year period had right at the middle is an event called the abomination of desolation. We've already talked about that. And it's a desecration of the temple. And Jesus warned us about when we see that event. So here is the passage in verse 15. We'll read the passage where Jesus is warning, and twice in this passage we'll see the word thlipsis used. So we remember that it's right in the middle of the, the seven-year period, the abomination that causes desolation. Verse 15. And, and as we read this, I want you to notice times. 
any time a word comes up that tells us of a time factor, I want you to notice it. First, verse 15, so when, that's located in time. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then, again, there's, this, there's a word for, that clarifies time, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then, again, see the time. For then there will be great tribulation or distress. If you're reading the NIV, the word there is distress. But it's our Greek word thlipsis, heavy pressure, not wrath. Notice that. For then there will be great distress, or King James Version, great tribulation. The adjective great is ahead of the word thlipsis. Unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short. Notice that, that the tribulation or the distress period of time is cut short. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, oh, there's a good word. We'll talk about that in a minute. For the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Verse 23. At that time, Jesus is trying to be very clear. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, in other words, it's not possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. He's telling us, look, I'm warning you about this time ahead of time so that you never say, oh Lord, you never told me. See, I have told you ahead of time. So, if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For, there's a continuing word, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Another name for Jesus. He called himself the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Verse 29. Immediately after the distress. Notice the word distress. If you've got the King James, you've got the word tribulation. Immediately after the thlipsis. Not the wrath. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then, another indication as to time, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then, just in case you didn't get it, <laughs> and then... All the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. That's worth a hallelujah. With power and great glory. And as we talked about last week, there's our event, our rapture. And here he clarifies very clearly in verse 31 what will take place at that time. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So there's two times that the word flipsis comes up. Well, what about Mark? Mark. Mark was the person that wrote down Peter's thoughts. Most people agree, most scholars agree that Mark, John Mark, the writer of Mark's Gospel hung out and spent a lot of time with Peter and he was the one that wrote Peter's accounts of this same uh, sermon message at the Olivet Discourse. What does he say? Turn with me to Mark. Now, 
it's almost word for word the same. But I'm going to have you turn with me, Mark 13, and if you're already tired of uh, turning, then it's up on the screen. Mark 13, verse 19. Mark 13 and verse 19. We're going to look in Mark's gospel for the other two times where the word thlipsis is used. And I don't have time to read the whole passage. It's almost, as I said, it's almost word for word as, as Matthew. Verse 19. Because those will be days of distress. There's our word thlipsis again, the word distress. Unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Go a little bit further to verse 24. Verse 24 in Mark's Gospel, Mark 13. But in those days, following that distress, he's talking about the Great Tribulation again, remember? The word there is thlipsis. There's our fourth use in a clear prophetic statement about the seven-year period of what's commonly called the Tribulation. But in those days, following that distress... At some point in the second half, after the abomination of desolation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, some people say, well, they design these clever things. And they say that the book of Matthew wasn't written for us Christians. You know, it uses the word elect. And uh, they say, well, you know, this obviously clear reference to the coming of Christ and the saints being gathered up. Actually, that means the Jewish people because Matthew wrote to the Jewish people. But they forget that right at the very end of, of, Mark, of Matthew's uh, gospel, uh, he tells, uh, Matthew records that he, he, tells, he tells him to uh, uh, go into all the world, preach the gospel, teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. What did he teach them? And we take that, we, we believe in the Great Commission. We don't say, oh, the Great Commission was for the Jewish people, but, but the passage where he's coming for the saints, that, actually that's for Jesus, that's for the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people are left behind because the rapture actually happened you know, several years previously before the seven-year period. I don't find anywhere where it talks about that. I've got to be honest with you. And just to clarify, you're still in the book of Mark, right? Right at the end of chapter 13, what does the Lord say? What, what I say to you, verses 36 and verse 37, I've got it here. What I say to you, I say to everyone. This is clear, this is still, he's talked, the context about the, is the second coming of Christ. He's saying it not just to the Jews or the Romans or... Guess what? I, I think that the, the letter to Timothy, yeah, it probably was to Timothy, but yet it's mine too. Don't we believe that? The, the letter to Titus wasn't, can't we hold on to that? Otherwise, we're throwing away all large portions of the Bible. Mark says that Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Do you think that maybe the Lord wants us to watch? <laughs> I kind of think so. The fifth time the Greek word thlipsis is used is very clearly spoken about as happening during the Great Tribulation. Hopefully we've got it on the screen. Revelation 7 verse 14. And it's there where, where people, the people are gathered together and we'll look at this next time uh, in, in more depth. Revelation 7 verse 14 says this. I said to him, my Lord, you know, because an angel had said to him, who are these people that are dressed in white and they've just, they've just been raptured? And, uh, and 
the, the person says, my Lord, you know. John is the one that's answering. My Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, I think, I believe with all my heart, that the, the tribulation period is not the wrath of God. It is the wrath of Satan. If we read the chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, it talks about a war in heaven where the enemy, Satan, is cast down. The great dragon is cast down. And he, he, he persecutes the woman. And when he can't get to the woman... He persecutes the believers in Christ, and that's very clear. So, if you are a mid-tribulationist or a post-tribulationist, and we'll look at this, this in a minute, I'm not so worried about you, because at least you're preparing for what's ahead. You're preparing that, uh, for, for some difficulties and some troubles. So, turn with me to... Uh, well, here's a diagram of the pre-tribulation position. Here's, a, let's get a picture, a diagram. This is, this is what most pre-tribulational teachers, a diagram that they will, uh, they will show you so that you may understand. This is Daniel's 70th week. And notice that the whole period of time, the seven years, is God's wrath. And they believe that the rapture takes place before the seven-year period even starts. And they do agree that the abomination of desolation is in the middle of the seven years. And they believe that the first half is called the tribulation, even though there are no scriptures, as I've already shown you, that there are no scriptures calling that first three and a half years the tribulation. But the second half is called the great tribulation. In this theory, you'll see that the wrath of God is being poured out, they believe, for seven years. Now think with me on that. We've already read about the abomination of desolation happening in the middle of the seven years, and along with that, we're told that uh, Antichrist will sit on, the, on a throne in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God. We'll look at it in a minute. Uh, how can that be possible if the wrath of God was being poured out for seven years? Can you imagine anyone standing up under the wrath of God for seven years? The Bible actually tells us about what the wrath of God is like. It, it gives us this passage in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. It says this, In that time, people will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord, and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Now, that's the pre-tribulation rapture. Show us the mid-tribulation. We've got a diagram for the mid-tribulation. They believe that God's wrath is in the second half of the period of time. They believe that the first half still is called the tribulation, even though there's no scripture that says it. Uh, but again, they believe the middle is the, the, the uh, abomination of desolation. Now the post, put up the post-tribulation. Uh, the post-tribulation rapture is that the whole seven years is God's wrath. Even though tribulation does never mean wrath, they believe that the rapture will take place at the end of the seven-year period. So now put up the pre-wrath. It's called the pre-wrath because the scripture is very clear that God's people have, are not destined to experience the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9. So those that believe in the pre-wrath, and I include myself in there, the first three and a half years, and we'll look at this next week when we work through the seals, We'll go through uh, Revelation chapter 6 and 7. We'll look at the seals and what happens during that seven-year period when the seals are opened. 
And uh, Jesus himself called this before the abomination of desolation at the middle of point. He called it the beginning of birth pains. And we talked about that in the first or second week when, it was, when, when the analogy is that the closer we get to the birth, the coming of Jesus, uh, the, the, the labor pains will get much more stronger and closer together. But in the first part of the seven years, the first three and a half years, they're scattered a little bit further apart, not so severe, although I'm sure from our viewpoint all over the earth, there will be difficulties. And the abomination of desolation takes place just as we've read here. The tribulation, the great tribulation begins at that point and it's cut short. No man knows the day nor the hour. Now I've got the rapture uh, taking place halfway, but really we don't know. We do not know the day nor the hour. We know it's not the end because Jesus himself, as I just read, you said that it will be cut short. So no man knows the day nor the hour. So if you are any... If you are the individuals that are around for that time and on your television set you see the abomination of desolation, Antichrist going into the temple, then uh, I think that you'll best take care from that point on. So, I need you now to turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Now last week, last week we talked in depth about what is the rapture, and we went into 1 Thessalonians, the letter to the Thessalonian church, and we, uh, we looked at a number of passages and explained what the rapture was. Now, after that letter was written by Paul, the Thessalonian church had a number of other questions. that Oh, they had questions about the second coming. After that first letter... Oh, that arose all kinds of different things about the second coming. So, guess what? They sent another letter to Paul, and now he's answering that letter. And right at the beginning of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, notice the word concerning. He's put the word concerning because he's answering the letter that's come back to him, and they want to know in detail what what's going on. So let's read it first of all. Verse 1. Concerning the coming, the parousia, the unveiling, the coming of Christ. This is not a gradual coming. This is the event. The word parousia is an event. Concerning the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. What do you think that means? It's the rapture, the snatching away, as we've already read. They, they put both of them together. The coming of the Lord, the rapture taking place. They want to know about this. And our being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Remember what the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord was, was wrath of God. That was terrible trouble, and we are not going to be around for that. They're, they're wondering about that. They're going through great persecution. Uh, he reads about, writes about it in, in the first chapter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, and it's interesting that in that passage... Uh, in that passage, the word thlipsis is used. <laughs> tribulation. That they were going through tribulation. Persecution is translated there. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about this passage in a minute. Verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. 
so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Paul used to teach on these things all the time. I wish it was so today. Now, here's the question. Give me a break to drink some of my coffee. Paul says that day, the day of the Lord, and with it our being gathered to him, will not come until three things happen. Verse 3, there is in front of you. What three things in the passage above does Paul say must take place before our being gathered to him in the day of the Lord? Give you a chance to think, discuss, process that. He's giving three things that must take place before the rapture, our being gathered to him the day of the Lord and his coming. So what's the first thing you see? The rebellion. How, how, many other, how many other translations? Somebody shout out another word. Apostasy. Well, some of your translations say apostasy. Some of your translations say rebellion. Is there another word? All of, uh, Rebellion or falling away. Another one says falling away, apostasy, rebellion. Now in the Greek is the definite article in the Greek, which, which means that this is the falling away. This is a major worldwide event. It's the rebellion, the falling away. Uh, and I wonder, what will cause such a grand falling away? This, i just take time out here. This is my motive for why I'm teaching this class. Because I'm afraid that so many people have not prepared themselves spiritually for any difficult times whatsoever. And when this period of time, and I'll tell you what I think, and it's conjecture on my part, I'll admit. I think there's, a, there's coming a time when Antichrist will come to power and he will demand that to be in his world uh, empire, you have to have the mark either on your right hand or on your forehead. And many people will come to that time and say, I've got to take that mark. And so you will fall away. That's my fear. I think the, the, the other thing with a pre-tribulation rapture, when people come to that point and they're confronted with having to take this mark, they'll go back to their pre-tribulation teachers and say, well, I thought you taught us that we're going to be out of here. We wouldn't have to face this. Well, I'm not ready for this. I've got, I've got to take this mark. Cause, are you with me? If we have not prepared for it, if we are told that we're not going to see any trouble, even though the majority of the world, world's Christians are going through tribulation and difficulties, and I'm not saying that we're already into that seven-year period. As I've said the first week or the second week, that seven-year period doesn't start until there's a peace treaty, a covenant that is confirmed in the Middle East. So this religious defection, the Greek word is apostia, apostasia, which means to depart, to defect, and revolt. It always speaks of a religious defection, a departure from what is considered to be orthodox. So I don't know, but I think that uh, when men and women are confronted, you've got to take this mark, uh, that some, I trust, none of us in this room or those listening to the tape at home will take that mark. Uh, I trust that you're preparing yourselves by getting into the Word of God, learning how to really call upon the Lord in difficulty and, and really drawing near to the Lord. The second thing Paul said must happen before the day of the Lord 
is that the man of lawlessness, notice he calls him that. doesn't call him the Antichrist. John calls him the Antichrist. Paul calls him here the man of lawlessness. I wonder if that's a hint. When there's a man come to the forefront of the world that won't stick to any laws. He's just going to make executive orders here, there, and everywhere. Well, he, he don't care about laws. He's just going to do what he wants. And when a man comes to the forefront like that, perhaps then we'll start thinking, well, maybe that man is the man of lawlessness. When he comes... That's the number two thing for him to be revealed. Now, if you're a pre-tribulation, you, you don't think that you're ever going to see that guy because the rapture for the pre-tribulation uh, means that you're going to be out of here before that man even comes to the forefront, which is my fear that, that, you know, that you'll believe that and not prepare yourself. I believe that this man, when he comes to the forefront of things, the political... Um, uh, forefront of things, I believe that he will, he will make this covenant, this agreement between Jews and Palestinians in the Middle East. And uh, that his bargaining position will be uh, to give the Jewish people what they want. They want a temple in the middle of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. But at the same time, he'll, his bargaining position will be to give the Arabs what they want, or the Palestinians what they want. And they want uh, a, a home for themselves. They want East Jerusalem. So somehow he's going to negotiate, and he's going to make a peace treaty there in the Middle East. Now, the number three thing that must take place before the Lord comes for his church, according to Paul, says that this man will oppose everything that is called God. In fact, he will exalt himself as God. He's going to sit in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God. Verse 4. That is what we have already said is the desecration of the temple, the abomination of desolation. He will set himself up in the newly rebuilt Jewish temple and at the present time, we do not see a temple uh, to the Jewish people right in the heart of Jerusalem. Now, let's change tack here. Now, I want to talk about what is the restrainer? Because uh, many people believe they're out of here because of the passage about the restrainer. So let's... What we're talking about now is who is the one that is restraining Antichrist's appearance. Now, let's explain that. Paul makes an assumption of the Thessalonians, and hopefully you're with me still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 6 to verse 8. And, and here, right at the beginning, we see Paul's assumption that they know what's going on. Verse 6, And now you know what is holding him back, Notice him, him here is the Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back. There's the restrainer. Some of you have got restrainer in your uh, passage there. The restrainer is holding him back. Some of you have got the words the one who now holds it back, NIV, will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Notice the word he, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. There's the assumption that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. There in those verses, and again, I'm saying it's an assumption. Let's look at that in the light of Scripture, and what does the Bible say? Let's, let's say it again. Paul goes on to say that those three things can't happen until the one who now holds it back, the restrainer, is taken out of the way. Who is the restrainer? 
pre-tribulationists say it's either one of two things. First of all, they say, well, the one that's restraining the evil one from coming is the church. And they say that the church has got to go so that the Antichrist can even come. Because at the moment, the Antichrist, the, the, Holy, the, the church is holding back the Antichrist so that he can't come. The church is the restrainer. But there's a problem with that. The word church, the Greek word ekklesia, is feminine. And here, the one who now holds it back, or the restrainer, is male. So it, it, can't, be the whole, it can't be the church. So there's a reply. Well, actually, the, yeah, but it's the Holy Spirit that's taken out of the way, the, the response is. And the assumption is with the Holy Spirit, gone out of the way. The Holy Spirit is the one that's restraining Antichrist and the Holy Spirit is taken away. So that leads us to think that the church will go because the church can't operate without the Holy Spirit. So there's the assumption that the Holy Spirit is going to take the church. There's our secret rapture, according to some, right at the beginning of the seven year period. But there's a problem with that. Verse 7 says, he, masculine, is taken out of the way. Now, let me quote something from Robert Van Kampen's book, The Rapture Question Answered Plain and Simple, Robert Van Kampen. I thoroughly re recommend you get in this book. It's very good. If you're interested in this topic, or this one, this is a little bit more detailed. The first one is easier. Marvin Rosenthal's book, The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. Very good books. Now, let me quote to you something that Robert Van Kampen writes. He says, The context of Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians is his instruction about what must happen before Christ comes to rapture his saints at the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 and 2. Making the true church of Christ an impossible candidate for the restrainer. You can't make the removal of the saints a condition that must be met before the saints are removed. The, and the day of the Lord begins, can you? Somehow the logic of that circular reasoning escapes me. Robert Van Campen then goes on to say on this same topic, and I'm quoting again here, he says, other pre-tribulationists will assert that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, reasoning that because the Holy Spirit indwells the true believer, the removal of the restrainer is an indirect reference to the rapture of the saints. But again, the circular reasoning that makes the true church an impossible candidate for the restrainer also makes the Holy Spirit an impossible candidate. Furthermore, like the elect of God, the Holy Spirit will still be on the earth after Antichrist begins his persecution of the elect. Now, I believe that there is a massive revival that's going to take place in the seven-year period. I think the more people will come to Christ. Can you believe that God is going to let seven billion people on planet Earth? There's a massive harvest out there. Do you think God is just going to give up on all that many people? No, there's going to be a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit when these things become so evident and even the blind amongst us can see these things that we are in the time that Antichrist rises and people will start to wake up. And the thing is, as you work through the book of Revelation and Daniel, you will see that in that seven-year period, again and again and again, you will see that the saints are still on the earth. So if there's saints on the earth, the Holy Spirit, is still going to be here. The Holy Spirit is not... Can you imagine the Holy Spirit leaving? Where's the church without the Holy Spirit? It's, it just it just will not happen. The church, the, the church and the Holy Spirit is going to be here until the rapture at some point in the tribulation. Now, 
just in case you don't believe me. I'm going to read to you a number of scriptures, and that's why I've put it in PowerPoint, because it's just too much, much work for you to just go passage to passage. I've put it in PowerPoint so that you can just easily read. I'm starting from Daniel. Notice, as I watched, verse 21, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. I believe this is all happening in the second half of the Great Tribulation, the second half of the seven-year period. Daniel 7, verse 25. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. What about Revelation chapter 6, verse 9? I, I'm proving to you that the saints are still here during the seven-year period. Revelation 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, and we'll look at the seals next week. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony, obviously believers, and the testimony they had maintained. Revelation 6, verse 11. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Uh, Revelation 7, verse 13 to 14. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What about Revelation 12, 17? Then the dragon, and this is the passage I referred to earlier, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What about Revelation 13, 7? He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Revelation 17, 6. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. Who are the saints? Believers. Believers in Christ, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. These are not Jewish people that are not saved. I'm sure that there will be Jewish people amongst them. The church is composed of Jews and Gentiles. What about the last one? Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, let's ask you a question, give you a chance to think. Why do you think God allows his people to suffer? What has history taught us about persecution of God's people? I'll give you a chance to ponder that. This is a long slog, a lot of content this time, but I'm hoping that you're catching what I'm, what I'm teaching you. Because this is important stuff. You know, we're talking about eternal destinies here. And I don't want that any should fall away. So I sense the importance of teaching this particular topic because uh, I don't want anyone falling away. Now, concerning all of these different accounts of the saints uh, going through difficulties and trials in the seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel. We won't call the, the whole seven year the tribulation because as we've just read, it's only the great tribulation starts at the midpoint. And before that is the birth pains, as Jesus said. So, 
Some people say that these people that I've just read about that are obviously going through trials and tribulations, experiencing difficulties, those are the individuals that are saved after the rapture takes place, before the seven-year period starts. Are you with me? But that is not possible. How is it possible? And this is why I took great time last week to talk through two different passages where it talks in Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, and the other passage as well in Luke 13, I think it was, uh, where it talks about the door was shut. Remember that? I made really stress that point to you that there's a time when he comes that the door was shut and people would come to that door and they'd be knocking, they'd be pleading, Lord, let us in, let, let us in. And he replies, I don't know you. I do not read in both of those passages that he said to them, well, come back a little later and I'll let you in. What you're essentially saying if the rapture, if, let's say, for, for instance, let's just say there is a rapture that happens before the seven-year period. Well, it cannot happen because all of those individuals, that means that we're teaching people that you can wait until the rapture happens and then come back, then come back later and you'll get in. I think that that's foolhardy theology. To, for, to, for anyone to believe that you can, when the rapture happens, as the pre-tribulation teachers teach, when the rapture happens, that you can get saved after the rapture, when Jesus categorically says that the door will be shut and people will come crying and weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. So I do not believe that there will be another opportunity. No, because the rapture does not happen at the beginning of the seven-year period. People are getting saved all the way through the seven-year period until Jesus appears in the clouds. And then it is a back-to-back -back event. Turn with me. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Now, if you think to yourself, well, I'm not sure, Keith, Let's look explicitly, even if you ignore what Jesus taught in Matthew 24, that this happens after the Great Tribulation, what about this passage? There are some people that say, well, uh, Noah, remember Noah? He got into the ark seven days before the, before the rain started happening. Well, here... Let's go clearly and look at that passage. Luke 17, and I'm reading from verse 26. This is Jesus' teaching. He says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day. Up to the day, Lord Jesus? Up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. Given us a second example, just in case we didn't get it. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day... Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. But Jesus really didn't know, <laughs> some would say. Because there, I've been there, pre-tribulation teachers will take you to Genesis and tell you that it happened seven days. Well, let's just look at Genesis. Turn with me to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 7. Because Jesus is saying here that it's a back-to-back -back event. The, in Noah's case, they got into the ark and straightway the, 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 the judgment fell, the rains. And then the very day that 
Lot left Sodom, came the judgment. And obviously the teaching is that this is a back to, there's no gap of time. Genesis chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 11. What does the Bible say? Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. I think the Lord has been very clear that, yeah, we've got to wait a period of time after the abomination of desolation for the rapture. And the Lord would encourage us and say, when you see all these things happening, then lift up your heads, as we saw said last week, for your redemption draws nigh. Now, there's a big question. Big question, yet we haven't answered. Who is the restrainer? If the one that is holding back Antichrist has got to be taken out of the way first before Antichrist will arise, who is the restrainer? If it's not the church and it's not the Holy Spirit, as we've seen, the Holy Spirit is very active in the seven. Who on earth is the restrainer? Well, I got an answer for you, I think. Turn with me to the book of Daniel. See if this witness is with you. See if the Spirit witnesses with you concerning this passage. Daniel chapter 10. If you find the book of Ezekiel, turn right. If you find Jeremiah, keep turning right, going through Ezekiel, and then you'll come to the book of Daniel. So, if you come to the book of Psalms, keep turning right. Go through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, and then you'll come to Daniel. There is a very interesting passage, and I don't have time to really go into it in great depth. When I teach on the spiritual warfare, I've gone into this passage. But before, we've taught that there are angelic beings, evil angels, and good angels that are serving the Lord, the other side of this world that are interacting with mankind all the time. We don't see them. This is spiritual uh, war that's going on. And as we saw in uh, uh, um, Revelation 12, that war will come to a culmination and Satan will be cast down in Revelation 12. Here we get a close-up view of something that's happening in the heavenly realms beyond the physical eyes. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. Daniel is telling us what happens. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, the spiritual demonic principality, the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, notice he's called a chief prince. Michael, the angel, the archangel actually, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Go a little bit further to verse 20. We'll see Michael being referenced again. Soon I will return. This is the angel talking to Daniel. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, this demonic principality over the realm of Persia, which is today the country of Iran. That spirit is still at work. Uh, over the country of Iran. Uh, these spirits are over nations and whole territories. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. Notice that. Michael is called your prince. He's speaking to the Jewish people, obviously. And the Jews at that particular time is in Babylon. And here the angel, the archangel Michael, is, is called your prince. The prince over your whole nation. The archangel over the nation of Israel is Michael. Now, go a little bit further. Daniel chapter 12. 
very interesting passage. I want to take this thought a little bit further and see if, see if you think this is a possibility. Daniel 12, and I'm reading from verse 1. And this is talking, about, I believe, about the tribulation, the, the distress, the period of time that we're talking about after the abomination of desolation. So let's read it. Verse 1 of Daniel 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people. What does it say? Michael protects your people. Isn't that interesting? This archangel protects your people. Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There's an interesting Hebrew word there, the word arise. I'll look at it in a minute. Let's read it first. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, hallelujah, I like that. But at that time, your people... Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. There's the rapture. Will be delivered at that time. Verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, you that's listening to me now, I trust that all of you are wise, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Now, our focus is not so much on the rapture, the resurrection. We did that last week, but... What are we saying here? What is this word arise? We are told that this archangel, Michael, will arise. And because he has risen, there is a great tribulation that happens because of something that he will do. I put it to you that Michael is the restrainer. We are told the archangel Michael oversees the whole nation of Israel. He protects the people of Israel, and he will arise. There's a, the, the Hebrew word used there is amad, A-M-A-D. Strong's Concordance translates this word to stand, arise, cease. This is interesting. Now, in the book of Job, you don't need to turn to it. The same word, amad, is used to describe the actions of the three friends of Job after they tried to accuse him of sin. An onlooker by the name of Elihu is moved to speak. He complains that the three now have nothing to say. Elihu says of them, Must I wait now that they are silent, now that they are mud there with no reply? Now that they stand there with no reply. What is this talking about? Michael the archangel will come to a point where he will cease and desist from his protection. And at that point, the enemy will be able to come to the forefront of things. I believe that if it hadn't have been for the archangel Michael, the great prince that protects the nation of Israel, the many wars that have been fought in Israel would have totally destroyed them. I have been and lived in Israel for a year and a half, and I've taken tours to Israel as well. When I was living there, I hung out with Lance Lambert, the writer and conference speaker. He wrote a book called The Battle for Israel, which I have at home. Should have brought it to show you. He spoke of the attack in 1973. Just one of the five wars. They've had a n more wars than that, but there have been smaller ones, like the last one in Gaza. That's not even counted as a war, a major war. 
but they've had five wars since 1948. The Yom Kippur War, the one that started in, uh, in 1973, the Day of Atonement War, when everything stops in Israel, the Syrians to the north attacked and the, the uh, Egyptians in the south attacked both at the same time when everything was brought to a standstill. When you're in Israel, during the, don't go to Israel when the Day of Atonement is on because you don't get nothing done. Nothing happens. All of them, they shut off TVs. They, all the taxis are all shut down. It's a, it's a day of fasting and mourning. Nothing happens. And the, the Arab armies chose that time to attack. Now, here's the interesting thing that I don't want you to miss. When that attack started, the Syrians had more tanks than the Germans used on the Russian front in 1944. Yeah, 1944. In the German offensive against Russia, it was 200 miles long and involved 1,000 uh, in, tanks. On the Syrian front alone, the Golan Heights, there were 1,200 tanks on a 20-mile front. And to the south, the Egyptians had 3,000 tanks, 2,000 heavy guns, 1,000 aircraft, and 600,000 men on the Sinai front. The regular Israeli garrison numbered only a few hundred men against Syria's massive tank attack. Lance Lambert, and I quote from his book, the Syrians should have been in Tiberias, one of, the, one of the cities on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, on the evening of the first day. But just like the Egyptians on the Sinai front, they stopped for some reason. The commanding officer of Israel's Galani Brigade said later in my presence that when the Syrians were first advancing, the Israelis had only two tanks and ten men at their Nafak headquarters. This man held no religious belief, but he referred to this as a miracle. Although he had been involved in the four previous wars of Israel's history, he had never seen anything like it. Wave after wave of tanks bore down on them. Then when they came to within one mile of the Nafak headquarters, they halted. They saw the Lake of Galilee, he said. They liked the view and they stopped. <laughs> As a result of those delays in the Egyptian and Syrian advance, Israel had time to regroup and reorganize. Many think that it was this period of time that made all the difference to the outcome of the Yom Kippur War. Another Israeli captain without any religious beliefs, said that at the height of the fighting on the Golan, the Golan Heights, he looked up into the sky and saw a great gray hand pressing downward as if it were holding something back. In my opinion, I'm still quoting, in my opinion, that describes exactly what happened. Without the intervention of God, Israel would have been doomed. And you can see many of these miracles. There's some, some videos out that you can get that uh, share some of the miracles that have happened in Israel during the five wars, uh, the construction of their nation. Let me go one step further. Recently, last month in fact, in August 2014, the war between Israel and Gaza that erupted when Hamas fighters began a rocket attack on next door Israel. World News Daily reported that an operator of Israel's Iron Dome missile defense set system said he personally witnessed the hand of God diverting an incoming rocket. Here below is the article. Let me read it to you. The commander recalled, quote, a missile was fired from Gaza Iron Dome precisely calculated its trajectory. We know where these missiles are going to land down to a radius of 200 meters. This particular missile was going to hit either the Israeli towers, which is the equivalent of the Pentagon in Tel Aviv, or a central Tel Aviv railway station. 
Hundreds could have died. We fired the first interceptor. It missed. We fired the second interceptor. It missed. This is very rare, he says. I was in shock. At this point, we had just four seconds until the missile lands. We had already notified emergency services to converge on the target location and had warned of a mass casualty incident. I'm still quoting. Suddenly, Iron Dome, which calculates wind speeds, among other things, shows a major wind coming from the east. A strong wind that sends the missile into the sea. We were all stunned. I stood up and shouted, There is a God! <laughs> I love to hear Jewish people saying that. <laughs> I witnessed this miracle with my own eyes. It was not told or reported to me. I saw the hand of God send that missile into the sea. It is my opinion that Satan cannot do anything against the Jewish people or the church without the permission of God. Michael the archangel is restraining every enemy that would seek to destroy the nation of Israel. God is bringing his purposes to pass. So what are we to conclude? I'm out of time. Let me bring this to an end. One verse from Scripture. I think I've got it on the PowerPoint. There is coming a time of difficulty. But at the same time of the difficulty, there is a great light that's coming. Here's what Isaiah the prophet says about that time. Verses 1 to 2 of chapter 60. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. If ever there was a word to describe today, it's that. Thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Yes, Darkness may be over the earth, even thick darkness. But God has promised that his glory will be seen upon his church. He will never leave us nor forsake us, even to the end of the age, Matthew 28, verse 20. He will snatch us up and out of Satan's hand after the tribulation has started. Again, we don't know the time frame, the day nor the hour. We just know that it's at some point after the abomination of desolation. That is the time we start to look up and look out for our God, for he will come. And from that point, there will be glory in your faces when we are changed into his image as we spoke last week. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us heavenward, that we are not of this earth. We are pilgrims and strangers on this earth, and every one of us must put off this mortal coil at one time. And Lord, we are so thankful that Jesus has paid the penalty of sin for us. And so we know that whatever happens in this world, we have eternal life. That cannot be stolen from us by the enemy. So Father, we pray that you will keep us for whatever time, if we are the generation that sees these things, we, our prayer is that, Lord, we, we long to see you come in glory. And Father, we will wait and put on Christ and, and serve you with all of our hearts until the day when we see you coming in the clouds and we are transformed into your image. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.